for the fourth video from lecture eight and the last part of part one, um, we're going to look at the chemical methods of controlling microbial growth. And there are a lot. I mean, you could look at every individual product out there for, for disinfection, or you could just think of them and how we group them. So we're going to do a little of both. Um, I'm going to talk you through some basic concepts in chemical disinfection, and then we're going to look at different groups of disinfectants. And I'm, I'm saying disinfectant, in some cases they do sterilize also, but disinfectant is the broad term I will use. Um, and then I will look at a specific brand of disinfectant wipes and all of the different um, versions they come in, because that will really illustrate some some of the differences between the types of chemicals. So you'll see that when we get there. And then at the very end, we will examine um, a common claim made by hand sanitizers, and we will look at um, how appropriate they are. So we start with the main, um, the main concept in um, chemical disinfection. This is something we can apply to lots of different situations. We will kind of apply this to antibiotics later too, but it's most makes the most sense when we look at chemicals um, for disinfection. This is the three C's, and that's just a mnemonic device. So first, the chemical, we think about what chemical is appropriate for the material we are trying to disinfect and appropriate for the microorganism we are trying to get rid of. So we have to think about both of those. You wouldn't want to use bleach, for example, on something that would be destroyed by bleach. And um, there are things like, you know, clothing with dyes. You can't use bleach. Um, concentration. This is also essential. Um, if you dilute a disinfectant, a disinfectant. Um, enough, it will be completely ineffective. If you use a higher concentration, in many cases it will work faster, in other cases it won't. So knowing the appropriate concentration is really key. So an example is um, ethanol. Using ethanol-based hand sanitizers, they have to be something like 70% ethanol. If they were 100%, they would not be as effective. The water that makes up the other 30%, that is actually critical for how they work. So that is a case where knowing the right concentration is important. And then the part that um, surprises people the most is contact time. Disinfectants do not work instantly. And if you think back to decimal reduction times, this is what we're talking about. This is when um, we have to use contact times that are a minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour to make sure um, there's enough exposure between the microorganisms and the chemical. And so for any microorganism, material, chemical, and concentration, there is a specific contact time that is most appropriate to use. A lot of times we don't know what it is, but um, as you will see, there are some cases where we do. And so these are things to think about. Even if you don't know the right answer, know that contact time is not instantaneous. Always it's going to be something like at least one minute. So if you wipe down a surface with bleach, the bleach should stay on there wet for at least a minute if not 10 minutes or an hour. Um, so let's get into it. The first one we look at is halogens, and halogens are molecules like, um, like chlorine, um, iodine, fluorine, um, and these are very reactive. Um, they pull electrons to themselves very strongly. Um, and so, they, um, yeah, so they react with biological molecules. And so they're very common in disinfectants all over the world. So some of them are useful for sterilization. Um, 
some are not. Iodine, for example, just molecular iodine, and in other cases, uh, mixtures of iodine and other things, these are very common, and they what they do is they stop proteins from working. Um, and so these can these have been used in healthcare. Um, another is bleach, which is hypochlorite. You'll find it as sodium hypochlorites or other hypochlorites. Um, and um, bleach can be either a disinfectant or a sterilant, um, but you have to be very careful to use it as a sterilant. Um, you have to make sure it contacts everything for enough time. And so generally we would think of bleach as um, a very handy, ubiquitous disinfectant you will have in your kitchen, for example. Microbiologists see this as the thing to have in the kitchen. Um, if you're going to clean a, a bathroom or something, if you have access to bleach, you can clean it enough. There are other things you can use, but bleach is a very trustworthy, useful thing. So what bleach does is really oxidize molecules, convert them to carbon dioxide or add oxygen atoms to them or add chlorine atoms to them. And that just disrupts their chemical activities. And so proteins lose their activity irreversibly. Nucleic acids break down. Um, li um, lipid membranes can't work as well. And so this is a very common thing. <clears throat> and typically when we buy bleach, it's concentrated. It's something like 5% hypochlorite by volume or by mass. I don't remember. And so we dilute it in water, um, one-tenth. Once we dilute it, it ends up being something like half of 1% total hypochlorite, and that's the most effective concentration of bleach, um, as we will see. So we'll come back to some more of the halogens later. Um, for now, we'll look at alcohols, and these are, these are like what we find in hand sanitizers. Hand sanitizers are just that. They, they're sanitizers. They don't really do disinfection. Um, what alcohol can do is disrupt plasma membranes, um, but it can't inactivate endospores. And alcohol can't do anything really beyond um, disrupting plasma membranes or other, other membranes. So I know it says denatures proteins. That's some proteins that are kind of weak, have weak structures. Prions have very strong structures. Alcohols do not disrupt prions. Um, and the capsid proteins of naked viruses are, are very strong. And so alcohols are not going to disrupt naked viruses. So for example, norovirus which causes severe vomiting in most people who get it and spreads very quickly. It has an incredibly low infection, infective dose. Norovirus is completely impervious to hand sanitizers. So um, where we do use alcohols routinely, um, where they can be very effective, is when we use them to clean contaminated surfaces because we're using them as a combination of decontamination and disinfection. And if we can remove the vast majority of contaminating material and then disinfect the rest of it, that can be very effective. And so we do use ethanol to clean surfaces in laboratories. Um, but yeah, so that's what I was just saying. Phenol is a specific version of an alcohol that has historically um, was used, for example, by Joseph Lister. This is what he sprayed on surgical wounds um, that sort of began the idea of preventing bacterial infections during surgery. And it's, there's some products that have phenol. There's some mouthwashes people used to use. And the idea was the phenol would actually kill the nerve endings. Um, so you wouldn't feel it burning you but it is um, very irritating to, um, to mucous membranes and the respiratory tract, um, but it's effective. And so there are derivatives of it. Um, we can find in soaps, 
and it's going to work basically the same way other alcohols do. Um, we also have surfactants, and these are going to disrupt cell membranes very effectively. So they're going to basically dissolve, um, dissolve lipids. That's a big thing they do. And so soaps are examples of surfactants, and soaps are very effective. Um, soaps do decontamination. They just remove bacteria, remove endospores. Um, we have uh, some acids people would use um, that are kind of weak, weak disinfectants. And then um, quaternary ammonias or quats, these are some of the best, uh, the best disinfectants we have, as we will see. Um, and so this is very common in, in food service and even in healthcare. Quaternary ammonias are some of the, like I said, the most effective um, molecules we have for disinfection. disinfection. Um, but again, if you think about how they work, they are disrupting um, cell membranes, right? That means they're disrupting lipid membranes. So they're not going to work against naked viruses, and they're not going to work against endospores, right? That's really how you should think about this. If you know how these chemicals work, you can make a prediction about whether they will protect you or not from whatever you're trying to clean up. So yeah, if, if, if you're cleaning up after somebody who has C. diff or norovirus, you really need to be using something like bleach or some very aggressive decontamination. Um, aldehydes will react with um, organic molecules. Um, I won't say much more about these. Chlorhexidine is a specific molecule that kind of combines um, surfactant capabilities with uh, chlorine atoms, and it can, well, and it makes sense because of that, it can disrupt membranes and disrupt cells, but not, um, not really endospores. So, this is another product you might see, and I don't, I really don't have enough information about this to give you many details about it. Um, gases are also a thing we think about. Um, a lot of times if you buy something like um, a surgical, um, disposable, things like medical gauze, it might have been disinfected by a gas. We wouldn't want something that needs to be like a dry absorbent material to, to be disinfected using a liquid, right? So we'd use a gas. And, and so something like ethylene oxide can actually sterilize something because it is unbelievably reactive. It's going to react with every molecule it touches. And so it's going to react with the outside of endospores and destroy them. It's going to react with the outside of naked viruses and destroy those proteins. It's going to do the same thing to any vegetative cell. So this is one of the, this, this is a horrifying substance. If you, um, if you get into organic chemistry and you look at the, um, the molecular structure of how this molecule is put together, it kind of screams reactivity. Um, and right. So they'll use this also, if they need to do something like disinfect um, a machine where you, you, you can't submerge it in any kind of uh, liquid. Chlorine gas is another. Um, chlorine gas is very common for things like drinking water and swimming pools. Chlorine gas is incredibly toxic, incredibly dangerous. Having a tank of chlorine gas is a very dangerous situation. Um, other than like chemical weapons in warfare, chlorine gas is one of the most toxic and dangerous things people can handle. Um, and so it's a very strong oxidizer. It works really well. And this is one of the best things that ever happened to drinking water. You can put chlorine gas in drinking water, it dissolves into the water, and in low concentrations, it's enough to kill most vegetative cells. And most bacterial pathogens are vegetative cells. So a little bit of chlorine gas in drinking water can completely protect us. Um, and the small concentrations that actually go into the water 
um, don't hurt us when we drink it. And that's kind of cool and a little bit miraculous. Another kind of unrelated thing are heavy metals like silver and zinc. And these have, um, they've been used for a long time for, for disinfection. And they, how they work, I haven't ever seen a good description of it, but some, but I, I can definitely imagine that they would interact strongly with some proteins and change the way the proteins work. And that prevents bacterial growth. Um, but again, they don't inactivate endospores. Um, one very specific molecule that we think about is hydrogen peroxide. And this is a very reactive molecule um, that is sometimes used as a bleaching agent because it's a strong oxidizer. So it destroys um, dye molecules. You can use it on your hair to change the color of your hair to destroy the um, the melanin that gives hair its dark coloring. It's very painful. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Um, so it's very useful against things like anaerobes that cannot protect themselves from oxygen. This is like an extreme form of oxygen. Um, as and as, yeah, as we will see. So those are the chemicals you need to know about. Um, and now I want to show you some specific examples of a, a very widely used um, kind of brand um, of disinfectant wipes. These are not used in a research environment, so I have never used these, but a lot of my students historically have been CNAs and, um, and medical technicians, and so they've worked with a lot of these things. And the more I learn about these, the more I just am really curious about them and I want them. Um, so I want to walk you through the different versions of Santa cloth. I'm not recommending them to you. I'm not comparing them to their competitors. I'm just using these as an illustration of, um, what we can learn by comparing them. And that's because some of them, have had to be certified by the EPA and the company that makes them has to send them to testing labs that um, deliberately and rigorously test what microorganisms they inactivate and how fast. And so we can trust their labels because they they're registered with the EPA and some of them, the consumer versions they make are, are done by the, the FDA and that's a different process. And that's where there's kind of like the silly labeling as you'll see, but we're going to start with the more serious ones that you would use clinically. So what I'm going to show you, sorry, is um, I've downloaded the labels and I'm going to walk you through kind of the claims they make and what they are made of and compare that back to what I've been showing you. Before we get into that, these are the things that are also in those products. Um, these are the, co the common inactive ingredients. I'm going to show you the active ingredients and you'll realize in many cases, it's like 99% inactive ingredients. Well, what are those? Right. And what I just added to this slide is water. I forgot this makes up a lot of them. All of this information I got from the manufacturer's website. Um, and I put this up here because you don't need to know um, the details I'm going to show you, but I am going to walk through these. Um, I am going to walk you through these and compare them to each other. If you plan to skip over these slides and skip over this video, know that there is something after them that is mandatory, that is not for your curiosity. So look at whether this symbol is at the top of the slides. Um, if it is, you can skip them. If it is not, you should not skip them. Okay, so let's jump into to it. I don't know how people refer to these, but I've seen them referred to by their color. And so that's what I'm going to refer to them as. I'm going to give you the color or the color they seem to be to me. Um, and then their major marketing claim. So the red version can inactivate 16 microorganisms in three minutes. So they're saying 16 different species, all of which would be inactivated within three minutes of contact um, with this cloth. That is, um, if you leave this, if you use that cloth to wet a surface and it stays wet for three minutes, 
these 16 microorganisms will be dead. So, you have to leave the surface wet for three minutes. That's not trivial, that's the contact time. Um, so, red, this version, what does it have as an active ingredient? 0.125% each of two different quaternary ammonias. So 0.125% of one of them and 0.125% of the other. And then all the rest is inactive ingredients. So what can it accomplish? Well, it can, st it can kill Staphylococcus aureus and Enterococcus faecalis, and those are rough, relatively tough to kill. Staphylococcus aureus is one of the toughest things to kill. So they recommend this for disinfection in kind of lower risk alternate care things, places like uh, dentist offices. The purple version, this one says 30 microorganisms in two minutes, so this is more serious. Its active ingredients are double the concentration of those two quaternary ammonias from the red version, so they're twice as concentrated, and then Another active ingredient is isopropyl alcohol. So it's a mixture of a quaternary ammonia and an alcohol. And what, what that means is that this can be used for decontamination, right? This, this can be an effective um, decontamination. Um, <clears throat> and in two minutes, it can kill Staphylococcus aureus, but also fungus like Canada albicans and mycobacterium. These are even tougher than Staphylococcus. So that is impressive. And so they recommend this for cleaning and disinfecting um, things like bed rails and stethoscopes, non-porous surfaces that are likely to get contaminated. Um, so quaternary, quaternary ammonias. They have um, gray, which has concentrations of the quaternary ammonias not so different from um, from the um, from red, but they're different inactive ingredients. And what that means is it's effective against these different bacteria, um, but it can be used around people who have respiratory sensitivity. So it doesn't have volatile, it doesn't have anything that will evaporate in its inactive um, ingredients. Orange. Um, this has a wide range of what it can kill because it's bleach. That's its its inactive ingredient is sodium hypochlorite. Or it's sorry, its active ingredient is sodium hypochlorite, 0.63 percent. So that is one tenth of a dilution of Clorox's concentrated formulation of bleach. So if you get Clorox concentrated bleach, it's about six. 6.5% hypochlorite, dilute it tenfold, you get something like this. Regular household bleach is 5%. So a 10% dilution of 5% bleach is 0.5%. So this is 10% bleach, basically. It takes a little bit longer, and if you're willing to leave this on something for four minutes, it can inactivate endospores of something like Clostridioides difficile or C. diff, and it can destroy the proteins in the capsid of a virion from a virus like norovirus. And so it can do everything the others can do, um, but also inactivate endospores and naked viruses, and that's impressive. Um, and so they do recommend this for high-risk areas, but it would have to be high-risk areas where you have four minutes, you can leave um, the surfaces wet. I don't know what color this is, so I'm calling it plum. Um, this says 50 organisms in one minute, and um, it has a, a high concentration of a different quaternary ammonia that I haven't seen in any other product. Um, and it has two different alcohols. And so the higher concentration and apparently the more effective quaternary ammonia give it a faster contact time. Um, so this would be compared to the purple version, if you go back and look at purple, and it just works faster than that. That's I would see this as identical to purple, but faster. Um, this green one 
is, I don't know, they don't market this at all because apparently people who need it know they need it and its active ingredient is hydrogen peroxide, 4%. So that's higher than what you would get in um, um, from a from a drugstore or a pharmacy. I think I think 3%, if I remember correctly, is the hydrogen peroxide you can get there. But, so 4% hydrogen peroxide is just going to be an oxidizer. And this, um, this can inactivate endospores slowly. It takes five minutes or most other bacteria quickly. So you have to know what you're um, trying to disinfect if you're going to work with this. And it, it's most impressive for being able to inactivate step or as quickly. And I don't know when they would use this. And then what I'm skipping is they also make um, Sani Hands, which is a regular alcohol hand sanitizer. And if you look that up, it says kills 99.9 .9 or 99% 9 .9 of harmful microorganisms. And that's how you know you're not looking at an EPA certified product. That's how you know you're in the realm of FDA certified hand sanitizers, which are compared to these things, hand sanitizers are garbage. So let's talk about it. This is important. When you see kills 99.9% .9 of harmful microorganisms, I want you to think through what that means and I want you to know what it means. So um, I see this often as insulting to my intelligence. Maybe you'll feel the same way. So let's think mathematically about what does 99.9% .9 mean. 99.9% .9 is 99.9 .9 out of 100. That's what a percentage means. I have to convert this in my head to a ratio. So instead of out of 100, out of 1. So what I do is I divide these numbers by 100 and I get 0 0.99 out of 1.000. So if I divide them both by 100, this is what I get. If I multiply both of these numbers by 10, I get 999 out of 1,000. They're all the same. 99.9% .9 means all of these things. So if a product says it kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria, that means it leaves 0.1% alive. So then we can go through this again and calculate what that means. So it's 0.001 out of 1, or 1 out of 1,000. Either way, that is 10 to the minus 3 if we go to the ratio, and this really is the main number we should look at. This, this ratio out of one is really what scientists would look at. And so um, that is 10 to the minus third, one times 10 to the minus three. So killing 99.9% .9 is a three log reduction. In other words, it's dividing by 10 to the third power. So you take the starting population of bacteria, whatever it was, divide by 10 to the third power, or 1,000. Um, and so, is that meaningful? Well, we have to think about starting populations and infective doses and compare them. So if you start with 10 to the sixth bacteria and you do a, that three log reduction, you kill 99.9%, .9 you end up with 10 to the third cells. So if this is lower than the infective dose, if the infective dose is way up at 10 to the fifth, then great, this is meaningful. If the infective dose is 10 cells, then no, this is not enough of a reduction. So here are some examples of starting populations of microorganisms. Um, and what comes to mind is human feces, because that's the thing we are most worried about cleaning up, um, right? I mean, that's what we would clean if we saw it. We would want to disinfect that. So if you have one gram of human feces, that's roughly 10 to the 14th bacterial cells. That's the most concentrated bacterial cells you will ever find in nature. If you have the smallest but visible tiny bit of human feces you have to clean up, um, that's probably around 10 milligrams. So that would be 10 to the 12th bacterial cells. So if you do a three log reduction on 10 to the 12th cells, what are you left with? You're left with a huge number of bacterial cells. Other things might be like a fingerprint that would have 
a smaller number. A little tiny bit of yogurt might have one of these numbers. Um, yogurt is not dangerous. A fingerprint, you never know. It could be contaminated with who knows what. Um, and just to help with this, um, I want you to see a four log reduction. If you see 99.99%, this is a four log reduction. Every time you add a nine, this number goes up and that what you divide by goes up. Um, and so if you know that this is a division by 10 to the fourth, you can apply this to these same starting populations. And so the point I want to make here is that something like hand sanitizer is not up to the challenge of protecting you from high populations of bacteria. I would contrast that with something like soap, which can disinfect, or which can do a little tiny bit of disinfection and a lot of decontamination. Soap is more effective than hand sanitizer, simply because it can physically remove the vast majority of cells. Um, whereas hand sanitizer is just trying to kill them with ethanol, and by the time the ethanol evaporates, they're not all dead. Um, so there's that. Okay, and the, what we're going to end with is antibiotics, and that is its own lecture. That's eight part two, so check that out. Thanks for your attention. This is a long video, um, and I, I hope you got something out of it.